Okay, welcome to the uh, February edition of the Key Ministry Disability Ministry Video Roundtable. Um, I'm Beth from Key Ministry, and today uh, we have another one of my colleagues from Key Ministry here today, and this is Catherine Boyle. And Catherine is the um, Director of Mental Health Ministry Very for good. Key Ministry, and she does a lot of other things too. And um, she recently attended a conference and has a lot of information that is going to be very helpful for us to hear um, that she wants to share from that conference. Um, I did forget one piece of information when I was giving instructions earlier. You can view, if, for those of you who are on this live, you can view this one of two ways. There's gallery view and speaker view. If you hover your cursor on the upper right hand corner, you can choose um, which, which way to view your screen. I prefer the Brady, Brady Bunch style is what I always say. All right, so um, Catherine, so you attended a conference that was in Washington, D.C., sponsored by Autism yeah. Speaks. Can you tell us a little bit about who all was at this conference? Yes, yeah, so, um, so I was really honored um, on behalf of Key Ministry to be invited to come to this conference. Um, what Autism Speaks did was invite um, a group of parents and individuals living with autism who were advocates um, they invited um, scientists from lots of different um, government agencies like CDC, National Institutes of Health, the National Science Foundation. They had university professors who work in autism related areas. They had Capitol Hill staffers who work on autism type things, um, legislation, funding, that sort of thing. Um, so it was really this robust group of um, I have to guess probably about 75 people um, over the two days who were there just to talk about their little slice of what they're doing in um, autism research, autism program development, autism support. And the, the conference had a particular emphasis on communities that are underserved, um, whether it's lower socioeconomic, um, immigrant communities, ethnic minorities, um, areas where there tends to be a, a, a fairly substantial gap between um, services needed and services that are provided for individuals living with autism. Um, so it was one of those, it was one of those conferences kind of like Inclusion Fusion Live where you know you just meet so many people that are doing really interesting things that you may not have ever heard about before or you know maybe you've heard this much and they are just you know a well of information and um, so it was, you know, my head was literally kind of swimming for a few days trying to figure out, you know, how do I communicate about this to our audience in a way that is relevant for the churches and the families that we serve. And so, um, you know, if you've read the blog post that led to this discussion today, you know, that's what I attempted to do was condense the information so that it's useful for churches, ministries, and families. Um, and it was it, it was real it was really um, very engaging um, couple of days. And I would also note that um, nearly every single person that presented that I talked with or that you know I observed in any way has a personal connection to autism. Um, it, there were you know there's a concern that you know people living with autism don't always have enough of a voice in this kind of world well there were several people who live with autism who were there who uh, one was a young man who was 26 who you know very articulately gave his perspective on growing up and supports okay. and employment I'll be home for a little bit we'll see what time they get done and then um and um and then there was a, a, a young man who's, I think, 10 or 11 who was there. He didn't really speak very much, but he's, you know, uh, level one, very high functioning child. Um, and there was a young man who was either level two or level three who um, he can communicate, but he definitely needs the advocacy of his father to really help propel him forward with employment and, and the things that, you know, he's looking for, you know, as a, a young man in his 20s or early 30s. Yeah. So, yeah, it, was, it was a great, uh, great conference. So thank you for helping us kind of picture who was there and what mm -hmm. audiences were represented. What was the purpose of this conference? Well, it was really, you know, to identify some of these disparities in, in different groups that, um, that need autism support, but there's just not enough data on what their unique needs are for their communities. 
um, you know, to understand what, you know, why do these pockets of, um, you know, gaps and services provided or, or, or diagnoses happen, you know, to try to get a bunch of these people who work on autism from all these different perspectives in the same place to understand that a little better. And so, um, you know, there's, there's a significant of research and data mining that's being done, uh, whether it's in, you know, the alphabet soup of government agencies, you know, CDC, NIH, and I mean, probably at least a dozen I'd never heard of before, um, you know, that are, that are looking at the, the, you know, the data gaps and trying to figure out, okay, how, you know, how do we connect with those individuals and families? Um, and then, you know, how do we, how do we develop education? to help, for example, immigrant communities where the word autism may never have been spoken in their language. You know, how do we get information about autism support, diagnosis, you know, research that's available to those kinds of communities? And, um, and also, you know, address accessibility to care kinds of issues. Um, you know, if you, if you live in, if you live in, um, close to a large city, you know, typically there's a lot of resources available, whatever your specific health condition is, um, autism or anything else. Um, and you may have a wait to get into services, but, um, you know, usually you can get care in a, a fairly reasonable amount of time. Well, if you live in an inner city, you know, particularly in a, a poor pocket of an inner city, or if you live in a very rural area, often accessibility to care issues are, are huge. I mean, there's, in the inner city, there's a huge waiting list because of so many people. Um, but in the poor community, you know, it, the access is because, you know, you have to travel 150 miles to be able to see somebody. So, um, you know, technology is alleviating a lot of those kinds of things, but I mean, there's still just really big gaps in needs you know, and, and then having access to meet those needs. In fact, one of the presenter was, was a parent who lives in rural Washington state, I think on an Indian reservation. Mm -hmm. And they literally had to drive around a mountain twice a week to get services for their child. It was like 160 miles one way. And, um, you know, I mean, that's a full-time job, just being able to take care of, you know, the needs of, of a child in the way that, you know, I think most parents want to take care of what their child needs. So. Um, and then, you know, and then information sharing, um, again, you know, how to get information to people who need it, who may not um, understand what they're seeing. Um, if, you know, if, if you're, you know, first generation community, um, you know, that maybe doesn't have the, you know, the language about autism. Um, and then also talking about the service silos, um, understanding that um, just the way that, you know, we have specialties in medicine. And so, you know, a, a a therapist doesn't necessarily understand what a neurologist does, but um, autism is a condition where there's a huge comorbidity with mental health issues. In fact, it, it's the high, there's the highest level of comorbidity um, with mental health issues in autism versus any other chronic condition. Um, and so um, that, that was really uh, you know, interesting to hear the physicians and the uh, the people who work, you know, in science talk about they recognize that and they recognize that that can't always be if the level of care that needs to be provided um, it, it, it's it's an impediment to delivering the kind of care the level of care that's needed um, for things associated with autism. So um, yeah, it was um, yeah, it was very very thought provoking. So. So I know you attended this conference right yes. around the holidays. Yes. And I know your mind was blown. <laughs> and, yes. And you just, you had a lot to process and um, you were able to write a blog post, which you referenced earlier. Right. And so this appeared on keyministry.org right. um, January 30th of this Correct. year. Yes. Um, so this, this was um, sort of a summary of the conference yes. and basically uh, five five takeaways, and then four action steps for the church. Right. So would you like to go through some of those um, for us to help us have a better appreciation of, um, you, know, what, what in, you know, what you were impacted by, and then what lessons, what advice you have for us? 
Yeah, I mean, I'd really, um, rather than, you know, just go through the, the list that's in the blog post, because, you know, I encourage anybody who has not read it to go back and, and read it. It's, you know, it's, like Beth said, it's on um, our Church for Every Child blog on January 30th. And, um, you know, I, I would say that you know, there's some good news and bad news points that really stood out to me um, that are encapsulated in those days and the, um, you know, the action steps. Um, you know, overall, I'd say that a, um, a really big good news thing is that there is an enormous amount of attention that's being paid to autism in all, you know, from all perspectives, um, you know, from geneticists who, I, there was a doctor who was talking about the research that, that he's doing. And I, I think they've identified like 86% of the genetic reasons that autism happens. Um, it, but then there's like the 14% of environmental things that they're really trying to understand better. And, you know, the, some of the different ways that um, his organization is doing that. Um, but there's, you know, there's this huge amount of um, really targeted federal government research and spending that's being done. And, you know, that is, um, you know, that is really a significant thing because in 1993, the National Institutes of Health only spent $10 million on autism research. And over the next few years, the budget across all federal agencies is about 370 million. Um, and so obviously that's a tremendous increase in a short amount of time. Um, uh, there's, a, there's also um, uh, the, inter the Interagency Autism Coordinating Committee, which I think is, is like a, a little mini backbone or agency that's coordinating autism um, services, research, supports, legislation across maybe 10 or 15 different federal agencies. And they have a report that is being required to be issued to Congress by September 30th, 2021. Um, there's a similar approach that's being done across federal agencies for addressing serious mental illness and how, you know, private sector, public sector, nonprofits, you know, are, are trying to work together to address the issues and, and, you know, basically improve life for everybody who's, who's living with these kinds of issues. Um, so, you know, that's really great news. Um, like I said, the, uh, I mentioned the, the legislation piece, the Autism Cares Act was signed into law September 30th. Um, 2019, and you know that's a, a huge driver for all of this federal spending and the, um, you know, but, but making sure that the spending is going where it's going to do the most good. So that's you know just the whole, and, and and I think in our culture, just the whole level of understanding of autism and knowing what it is and what it's not has just risen dramatically just in the life in the lifetime of my kids, you know, who are in their early 20s. Um, but the bad news is that there's still these huge pockets of the population that are just really underserved. Um, and, and um, you know, the, the silos of service delivery don't help. Um, but, you know, I would, I would really say one thing that really impressed me was that the number of doctors, developmental pediatricians and university professors and neurologists who were talking about their willingness to want to treat the whole person and not just what their specialty is. So I think that that is, um, you know, maybe something that's different in the past 20 years versus the previous, um, where they recognize that just because they understand neurology, they don't, they don't necessarily understand the therapy needs of a person who's struggling with mental health issues because, you know, they have level one autism and, and they don't communicate well with their peers. So, um, so yeah, um, and then, you know, the, so the bad news, you know, there's these pockets, um, but, you know, interestingly, um, you know, several physicians and, and different presenters talked about the importance of grassroots advocacy and how, you know, many doctors who specialize in autism in, um, whether it's in like large populations like in New York City that has large immigrant populations or um, in other areas that, you know, they have developed collaborations with grassroots advocates um, at, and physicians to try to get 
information and make sure that they really understand the, the problems and the issues that these communities face. And I really think that's an area where the church can step in and be helpful because, you know, the, there's not a doctor everywhere, you know, in, in the country. There's going to be places where you have to go 160 miles to get the service that you need. But there's churches, you know, in most, and, you know, much like the approach that we have um, advocated on the mental health side, um, you know, the, the church can really be um, a place where people can, um, you know, where the pastors and the staff can get to know the physicians in your area and, and set up educational kinds of things and really understand the needs that are there and come alongside the families um, to support them. Am I, am I breaking up? No, well, a little bit, but okay. I, can you, I just have to jump in. Can you share the story about the Chinese American church in New York City? Yes. Yes, because that is really amazing. So I had, I, it was a two night, it was a two day conference. And so I had dinner um, with the whole group and I, I was so happy to sit beside this developmental pediatrician who's, um, I think she's a first generation um, Chinese American, brilliant doctor. And um, I think she's a believer. And she was talking about how there was um, this population of, you know, large population of Chinese Americans um, living in New York City, um, you know, most of them first generation, many of them Christians, and they were having a hard time finding disability support services for their their kiddos or their adults who, you know, who had disabilities. And so they ended up creating this organization called, um, I have it written down here in my notes, it's something like, oh, the Center for All Abilities. And so it was so helpful for parents to connect them, you know, to I mean, I don't know the breadth of what they did, but, you know, my impression is that they helped them find services. You know, they, they understood their needs and they understood, you know, they could communicate in their language. And so they helped connect them to all the support services that they needed. They were so successful that they rapidly outgrew the, their space. You know, they were just a little not-for-profit, um, I think in the Bronx. And so they relocated and when they relocated, a huge majority of the families that they had served relocated to continue being, being near them, to continue getting their services. And so that actually ended up spawning, spawning um, a variety of not-for-profit services that help families, um, uh, not 100% in the Chinese immigrant community in New York City, but largely, um, if you look at what they all are you know, addressing and the, the needs that they're serving, um, you know, there's a lot of uh, immigrant communities that are supported, but there's probably a dozen different organizations now that have spawned as a result of, you know, this one organization um, coming alongside families in church, you know, to help meet their needs. So, uh, so yeah, that was a really exciting thing to learn about. So, um, yeah, so again, I just, I just think there's so much opportunity for the church to step in here. Tell us a little bit. I know there's lots of, we're ministry leaders, but um, many are parents as well. Um, right. So tell us a little bit about um, some of these transition cliffs, you know, how, like, why is that so important and, or what, why is that an issue, these service gaps and transition cliffs? Well, sure that's something everybody's facing. Yeah, yeah. And so, I mean, if you're not aware of the term, um, you know, when, when children have disabilities, I mean, let's, let's, Think of a you know an example of a family that has a child with level three autism where they really don't communicate very much. Um, you know the the services that are provided by the federal, state, and local government um, tend to disappear when the child becomes 18, 21, 25. And so um, the good the good news is that there's a, a definite recognition among all these presenters that. Nobody, nobody thinks that autism just goes away because you become an adult. You become an adult with autism. And so what are you doing? And so there's a, a big effort um, among some of the presenters to make sure that education and opportunities are there and to communicate that, uh, not education, but employment opportunities are, are available. Um, this, one, this one dad who's a, from that Chinese immigrant community, you know, first generation American, 
um, has the son with level three autism. Well, you know, he works as a janitor and, you know, but he's had ups and downs with his employment. You know, when the employers that he's worked with have learned to communicate in a way that um, I think his name was Vincent, um, Vincent can understand, he does great at his job. If the employer doesn't take the time to communicate the way that Vincent can understand, well, he doesn't do great at his job. So it's just little things like that that um, can mean the difference between employment or not for somebody like Vincent. Um, you know, you know, it, it's not just the employment, but it's it's you know, it's other things that go into making a meaningful life as an adult. You know, just because you're an adult with a disability doesn't mean that you don't want to contribute. Um, and you know the parent advocates who were there and and the young man who was in his mid-20s who was there who has written a book and created his own um, um online shop for his artwork and and that sort of thing you know really talked about how there needs to be you know a, a better approach to make sure that you know people people are able to use their gifts and abilities um just because they have a disability doesn't mean that they don't want to do that so um, I, I, hopefully I addressed the question, but, you know, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a real, it's a thing I, I, I heard from the parents who were there uniformly that, that, you know, that age out cliff is something that they all dread. So, um, you know, the more that, that the churches and support ministries can come alongside and help connect people to employment opportunities or ways that they can use their gifts, just, I mean, that's a huge opportunity again for the church. So, I do want to talk about some of your ideas for um, what the church can do. The champion piece. Um, and I also want to make sure that everybody gets a chance to ask questions of you if, mm -hmm. if they have questions. So yeah. is this a good time to start talking about some of the takeaway or some of the yeah. um Yep, definitely. The okay. Yeah, if you want to dive in, but make sure you hit number three for sure. Okay. All right. Well, um, again, you know, the, the advocacy part is really crucial. Um, you know, the, I, I would just encourage the church to, um, you know, let autism parents um, get to know one another, you know, use their space to, to form communities and grassroots organizations so that they can figure out how to collaborate with physicians, researchers, you know, whatever in your, in your area to be able to meet some of the unmet needs of the community. In fact, um, somebody suggested that um, for other chronic health conditions, uh, you know, and, and, and no examples were given, but you know, the thing that comes to mind for me is like people who live with maybe cerebral palsy or, or cystic fibrosis, you know, those kinds of things, you know, maybe there are um, more well-defined support organizations that, started at the grassroots level that could be used as a template for the autism parents to be able to connect with resources support and develop um, develop resources and support if they if they aren't in existence in their community and and you know let the church help facilitate those kind of connections um, you know education was another huge thing i mean that's a that's something that we talk about with mental health ministry specifically is um, you know that letting the church um, consider education to be part of their their mission you know all of life is really ministry um, you know the the when you meet people's physical needs you know that often leads to an opportunity to meet their spiritual needs and so um, you know when churches can kind of serve as a backbone organization um, to bring you know to highlight educational opportunities what is autism you know where support resources um, that can go a long way towards helping people overcome their fear of, you know, if, if this is a new concept to them, or if they've been thinking that they were just a horrible parent because, you know, nobody in their community recognizes what autism actually is. Um, so, you know, that, that could be a huge thing. You know, I think about, you know, there's a lot of churches in my area that have um, ESL classes. Well, gosh, I mean, a great opportunity is to have, um, resources translated into, you know, the local language, so, or the language of the, the person that you're teaching in ESL class, so that, um, you know, if they have a child that is really is struggling, you know, help them understand in their language, 
you know, what they're seeing so that they can get the help that they need. Um, so the third thing um, that I think, you know, can be an action step for the church is really having that, that champion, that liaison, that person can, that can meet with the physicians who are in your church and in your community or the support organizations, but can also help connect the parents, the individuals, um, you know, the grandparents who are looking for help. Um, so hugely helpful, particularly in these, these pockets where, uh, you know, people don't know the language of the physician, you know, not only, not only medical literacy, but they, you know, they don't speak English enough to understand, you know, what the doctors are trying to communicate. Um, so, um, yeah, I just, in, in fact, I, I wanted to give a little, couple little personal examples. Uh, so I'm in the Richmond, Virginia area. Um, years ago, I met this woman who, this is all she does. I mean, she basically formed a ministry to help families who can't find the, the services that they need for disability, of, of any kind of disability, not just autism, not mental health specifically, but, you know, all those things. And it's her full-time job to just connect people with what they need. And she's a, a, a warrior kind of woman, and she badgers the, the local legislators to make sure that they're remembering these people when, you know, they're passing legislation too. And, and, and just in a personal anecdotal story, I met with another ministry a few years ago and was talking about the needs for this kind of, you know, this kind of role in the community. And the ministry was actually trying to start that very thing. And they offered me a job on the spot. So, you know, I'm telling you, you know, there is so much need here. And I personally think that, you know, if your church has a big benevolent budget, that this would be a great thing to invest in, is to pay somebody to be in your church to help families get the services that they need. Um, so the last thing I want to talk about um, is um, advocacy, a couple different ways of advocacy, but then I want to do a screen share real quickly. Um, but let me talk about the, the advocacy things. So if you are, are at all familiar with um, mental health supports, there, there's this huge movement across the country called peer support specialists. It's actually, um, uh, there's training and certification programs. Uh, so individuals who have lived experience with mental illness, mental illness can actually get certified to help other people who have mental health needs. Um, so yeah, it's, it's everywhere in the country. It's, it's a really well-defined, um, program and it, it's a great career path for people who um, maybe are unsure of what they they want to do. They've, they've lived through a serious mental illness, they're in recovery, they want to share their experience and encourage other people along the way. Um, well there's also a family peer advocate program that is just starting across the country. Um, I'm not sure where it is outside of New York State, but New York State has this program that they've developed. They've got training and certification. Um, the, uh, the services that these people provide, um, you know, basically it's a, it's a mom who has, you know, gone through the training. She's got a child with a disability and she's helping another mom. Um, uh, Medicaid is in the process of approving the services that these, you know, family peer advocates provide. So that, you know, so that Medicaid will reimburse them. So essentially, you know, the, the expertise that the parents are gaining at navigating all these systems and, and caring for their child um, can be a career path for them. So I found that to be incredibly encouraging. Um, I'm not sure that everybody would be able to, you know, have the, the time or the ability to step away from caregiver duties to do that, but there are certainly people who, who do have the ability to do that. And, and I just thought that was really encouraging. Um, but the employment information was um, something that I wanted to show you um, specifically in the blog article, because I thought this was just a great thing and that everybody needed to know. So um, there were a couple of different mentions of employment services for individuals who are on the spectrum. And yes, yeah, scroll down almost all the way to the bottom and keep going. Okay, so go, okay, go back up, go back up, sorry. 
Yeah, go back up to the, those two pictures. So there's a, a program called, um, it's IPS, Individual Placement and Support. So it was a program that was initially developed to help people who have serious mental illness obtain employment. And so this has been a program that's been in place maybe 20 years. So it's been expanded to adults with autism and they're starting to have significant results. Similar, scroll down so that we can see the other slide. Um, so, you know, this is just a little bit of their background um, that the IPS program, but it's now this worldwide program, you know, it's, um, you know, universities and, and you know, data centers, they, they, wanna, they wanna see things that work so that, you know, they will, before they'll put money into them to have them expand. Well, this is one thing that has, it was initiated, I believe, by um, Dartmouth College and has just expanded all over the world, but now it's being expanded also to um, programs across the country for people with autism. So, you know, if you're interested in this program and information, I would really encourage you to click the link and contact the lead researcher on the program. She's a delightful lady named um, Dr. Jennifer McLaren. She's with Dartmouth. And um, I was just personally so excited to see this because, you know, there were, there were two young men who were advocating for themselves about how, you know, employment was so needed at this conference. And, and you know, here's a program that's already in place that is rapidly expanding um, that, you know, something that I believe could really be shared broadly and, and, you know, we're trying to do our part. So the last thing I would also say, um, we can jump off the screen here whenever you're ready. Um, so I mentioned earlier that there's um, this organization called the Interagency Autism Coordinating Committee. And it's, it's a little backbone organization that's making sure that all these different federal, federal agencies, it's about 15 different ones that have anything to do with autism, that they are coordinating to provide a report to Congress by September 30th, 2021. They are looking for more public members. Um, I think that the um, application period is open through the end of this week. So if you are an autism advocate, if you, you know, have a family member, if you yourself have autism and are interested in possibly being a public member, you know, please click the link in that blog post. And you know, I don't know that we'll be able to share it here because it, it is um, going to expire the end of this week, but um, you know, it, they are looking for a few more members. So I encourage you to just see what the application process is. So just as a reminder for everybody, that blog post can be found on keyministry.org and then click on our blogs and the Church for Every Child and it was the January 30th post. Um, Catherine, could you tell us a little bit about this little, this little thing we have coming up in April? Oh goodness, <laughs> and, um, what, what, um, some, uh, what some of the uh, content that will address um, some of the issues that you've talked about today? Well, we have several different presenters in April who are people who live with autism. And I think that that's a really insightful and helpful um, perspective to have. I mean, you know, there's this whole line of thought, nothing about us without us. And we totally get that. Um, you know, people who live with mental illness should be the people who can speak into, you know, what is helpful for people with mental illness. People who live with autism or people who live with um, any, any chronic condition must have a voice in saying, you know, what life is like, what is helpful, what is not helpful. Um, so I, I find that really interesting. I mean, not only our, you know, one of our good buddies, Lamar Hardwick, but also Lori Seely um, and Father Matthew Schneider, who's a, a priest who uh, has high functioning autism or level one autism. So I think that, you know, their perspectives are gonna be very helpful. Um, and then we have a number of different uh, pre presentations that are about, you know, sp spiritual development for people who are living with disabilities, including things like autism. So, um, you know, 
we, we, amongst ourselves at Key Ministry, we talk about, you know, special needs ministry 2.0. And we really feel like, you know, in many of these areas, we're, we're beyond just the development of special needs ministry, but we're starting to talk about, all right, here's how you take it to the next level. So whether it's um, the, the intensive that we're going to have on trauma, uh, which is definitely a, a, a little bit higher level than we've had before, or some of these conversations that will, and presentations that will be about, you know, the, a deeper look at um, spiritual development, spiritual um, practices, you know, engaging people with any ability and disability in service, you know, because everybody has something to give to the body of Christ. Um, you know, those are, those are a lot of the kinds of things that we're going to be talking about at IFL 2020. So we hope we see every one of you there. Yes. So keyministry.org slash IFL 2020. And um, registration is still open, um, but boy, is it filling up. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so great. Are there any questions? I'd like to open it up, um, join the discussion. You can either put something in the chat or just unmute yourself and, and ask Catherine a question or a share a statement, whatever you'd like to do. Well, you know, um, before we get anybody chatting, I, I would just have to say it was, you know, it was really an interesting mix of people. I, I am pretty sure that I was the only representative from a ministry who was there, um, but that's okay. I mean, heck, I, I mean, <laughs> If you, if you guys follow our ministry, and I, and I mean, I think probably most of you are regular followers, you know that, you know, we, we cover a lot of worlds that don't always naturally intersect, but the church is supposed to be going into places, you know, where, where people need Jesus for sure, but also, you know, to meet needs that maybe aren't being met. I mean, that's, that's kind of the heart of you know, disaster ministry or, or international ministry where they've never heard the, the name Jesus. Um, I mean, to me, this is the same kind of thing. It's just a mission field that may be in your backyard. Um, but interestingly, so one of, in one of the breakout sessions at the conference, there was a, um, uh, the, there was, at my table, there was the, the father and the young man who are first generation Chinese American. Um, the father emigrated in the last 25 years and I think the son was born here. Um, but the father is a believer and he follows key ministry. And so we were talking about what we did, you know, around the table and he's like, oh yes, I know key ministry. I know I follow your work, you do good work. I, I was really pleasantly surprised. Mm -hmm. So, um, but yeah, other, other, than, other than me, there was um, the lady who invited me who is with Autism Speaks and they're developing a faith-based program, which is why we got invited. So um, it was, you know, it was really quite interesting to hear all the different perspectives. So Catherine, tell us, because I actually don't know the answer. <laughs> tell, what was the name of this conference, this meeting? Oh, thanks a lot for asking the unanswerable <laughs> That's question. That's why you didn't mention it. Okay. It was like, it, I think it was the health equity. It was something about health equity okay. because it was about, you know, it was about disparities in different segments of the population and not, not having access or um, not being able to, because of whatever reason, um, obtain services for autism. Okay. Thank you. I can get the exact name and we can share it in the description when, um, when this is over, if that's helpful. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? Really? <laughs> Okay, what are my thoughts? I, oh, wait, I can't wait. see the chat. What are your thoughts on the church I attend wanting to implement a separate service for families? Well, I think, you know, you and I can both comment on this, Beth, and probably a lot of people on the call too. I mean, it seems like it, it goes both directions. I mean, I think you just really have to be sensitive and specific to what the needs are and, and the desires are in the families and your in your church. Um, Cause you know, we, we get to see 
it, it, it's, it's interesting to be in the position that Beth and I are in with key ministry because we get to see every conceivable approach across the country, whether it's, you know, through the, the special needs and disability ministry leaders group or people who contact us for training and, and resources and support. You know, some churches do it great, you know, having the separate services for families that have children with disabilities or uh, adults with disabilities, but others want to be completely integrated. And I think, you know, you just need to get to know your families. What helpful for them um, and you know people really respond well when they believe that they've been heard and included and you know and that they're wanted so you know there's not going to be a one-size-fits-all answer except that you know make sure that they are heard and they have a voice in whichever direction it goes and I think we want to strive for inclusion as much as possible without taking away some special things that are in place for those who need something completely different. Um, so for instance, if there is like an environmental situation that um, they create for some kids who need a completely different, and you, you want to, as much as possible, um, you know, create an environment within, let's say your children's ministry that um, can really welcome everybody and everybody can, you know, have, can be successful in that environment. Um, but then if you do need to create something unique for certain individuals um, to allow them to participate, you know, that might be, that might work well. I, I, I'm, I guess what I'm thinking is I wouldn't just start out saying, okay, if you have a disability, this one's for you and everybody else come over here. Um, but I don't think that's what you were asking, <laughs> so. You know what, I just found my folder from the conference and I can give you the title. Oh good, okay, what's it called? Okay, it was the Autism Speaks Thought Leadership Conference on Health Equity. So I'll say that again, Autism Speaks Thought Leadership Conference on Health Equity. Okay, thank you. And you know, just love them or hate them, Autism Speaks has been instrumental in really moving to the place that we are now where you know there's an interagency autism coordinating committee working you know across all the different federal agencies and um you know we we have i you know i'm personally grateful for the work that they do can you tell us a little bit more about their faith-based initiative yes yes so um it's called blue blessings they rolled it out, I believe, last fall. Um, we actually have um, one of the directors of the Blue Blessings program coming to speak at Inclusion Fusion, and she's going to talk about their program. Um, <clears throat> they are a, um, it's a, it's a faith-based initiative, but um, they're ecumenical. So, you know, they are working with all different faith groups just to, um, again, try to, uh, in a similar way that NAMI Faith Networks, you know, where NAMI, the National Alliance on Mental Illness, has um, Faith Net, which is basically, you know, support groups that incorporate faith, um, local support groups that will incorporate elements of faith in them if, if that's something that the participants desire. Um, so I'm, I don't think that Autism Speaks is looking to create support groups, but they are just um, trying to help the families that they serve and the communities that they serve connect to faith-based type resources um, across the country and, and around the world because they are international. Uh, we had a, a thing in the chat, so let me read that out loud. I work in a school setting as a paraeducator in a special ed class with students ages 18 to 22, and I'm really excited to share your January blog and some of the resources with a special ed teacher. I hope she shares with the parents of her students, because I know many of them are struggling with preparing for their young adult kiddos to phase out of services. Yeah. Most of the students in my classroom are lower functioning, nonverbal, so finding support is crucial. Yes. I always try my best to connect my work environment with local community and church supports and feel it is so important. Yes, wonderful, wonderful. Yeah, another link that was in the article was to Spectrum Works, which is, you know, they're all about placing people on the spectrum with employers. And I, I'm pretty sure, without looking it up, I'm pretty sure that Autism Speaks has developed a training program. I'm not sure that the, if they're working through Spectrum Works or if it's a separate thing, but um, you know, they're, they're 
training employers so that, you know, like this young man, Vincent, so that, you know, the employer will understand how to communicate so that Vincent can be effective in what he does and doesn't lose his job, you know, because mm -hmm. the new employer communicated effectively, Vincent did great. So, um, yeah, Autism Speaks is working very hard on that. And I don't know what that specific aspect of their work is called, but um, I'm sure it's on the website if, you know, if you want to look for something that's uh, related to job development. Right. So a lot of these links are actually in the blog post. So that, that's something yeah. that's that. Yes. Okay. All right. Anybody else? Any last thoughts? All right, well, thank you very much, Catherine. It was, um, and everybody for participating. And um, this will be um, up on our website under um, the, so keyministry.org, and then we have a section of resources for churches, and our video roundtable recordings um, will, are all listed on there. So give me about a day or so, and that'll be up there. Um, and, uh, yeah, so we will see you all next month, same time, same place. And uh, let me just jump in. And I'll also, oh yeah, go ahead. I'll also share the video on social media so you can find it there as well. Just, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Okay, that's okay. Um, and then also we hope to see you at Inclusion Fusion Live um, here in Cleveland on April 24th and 25th. So, all right, well, thank you very much and um, have a great rest of the week, everybody. Bye.